We spent part of last week talking about forces that were balanced. We spent a little bit earlier today talking about forces that weren't balanced, when we when forces that resulted in an acceleration. Today, uh, I want to finish off with a little bit more detailed explanation of those forces that are unbalanced. In other words, I want to talk about specific forces, types of forces. The first type of force that I want to talk about is called weight. Now, lots of us think of weight and mass as the same thing. They're not. When I say my mass is 70 kilograms, you can't say my weight is 70 kilograms. If my mass is 70 kilograms, that's the amount of matter that I possess. That's my mass no matter where I am in the universe. My weight is not my mass. My weight changes depending upon where I am in the universe. My weight is the force of gravity experienced by an object which of course changes depending upon what the gravitational acceleration is at whatever point in the universe that you're, you're at. The force of gravity acting on an object, we'll say. Now, of course, we know that force is F is equal to M times A. Specifically here, we'll say that force is equal to M times A, A being at 9.81 meters per second squared. What we often do is kind of rewrite that equation in a specialized form and say F is equal to M times G, where G is 9.81 meters per second squared. Now, technically, that's a downward force. Technically, my weight is measured in Newtons, and it's acting down as opposed to a positive upward force as we think of gravity. But really, it's a downward force. The next force that I want to talk about is what we call the normal force. Normal in physics means 90 degrees. So we're talking about a force that's at 90 degrees. Specifically, it's a force that acts at 90 degrees. We'll say it's a force that acts up at 90 degrees. I'm putting up in quotation marks because it's not necessarily up but it's always at 90 degrees. I'll explain what I mean by not necessarily up. Force that acts up at 90 degrees to the ground. But I'm going to put ground in quotation marks as well because it's not necessarily the ground. If I'm sitting in a roller coaster cart like you'll be doing in May on our field trip, okay, the normal force is provided by the track. If I'm standing on the ground right now, the normal force is provided by the ground. If you're sitting in your seat right now, technically the normal force on you is provided by your seat. That normal force is always at 90 degrees to the ground or to the, to the track or to your seat. And usually it's upwards, but not always. Sometimes, sometimes we experience a normal force. Most times we experience a normal force that's upward. But sometimes we experience a normal force that's, if you're on a hill, a normal force that's up at an angle. Occasionally, maybe you're in that roller coaster and you're upside down at the top of the vertical loop. In that case, the normal force is actually acting downward because it's provided by the track. We say it's the force of the track, of the floor, of the ground, whatever it is that's pushing upwards or downwards, whatever the case may be, at 90 degrees to the surface. Connor, you had a question? Don't have a date yet. Okay. Now, the force of gravity, on the other hand, is always acting downwards. So the force of gravity here would be downwards. The force of gravity here would be straight downwards. The force of gravity here would be straight downwards. That doesn't change. My normal force is what changes. Now, my force of gravity is my weight, but my normal force is my apparent weight. It's what I perceive my weight to be. This is my real weight. This is how heavy I really am. This is how heavy I feel. You don't perceive your real weight, which is kind of odd. How much do you weigh? Oh, 700 newtons. Yeah, that's the metric way of measuring weight is in newtons because it's a force. How much do you weigh? 700 newtons. Um, but oddly, I don't perceive my actual weight. I perceive my normal force, not the force of gravity. Let me explain why. 
I'm standing on the ground right now. The, the earth is pulling me downward at, with a force of about 700 newtons. I feel like I weigh 700 newtons, but not because the ground is, or the earth is pulling me downward at 700, but because the ground that I'm standing on is also pushing me up at 700. I feel 700 newtons, but not because gravity is 700, but because the normal force is 700. Let me give you a situation where they're not the same. You're in an elevator. How many people have ever been in the CN Tower? A few of you? Or any other tall building that's like 80, 90, 100 stories high? Okay, you're in the CN Tower, you're in some really, really tall building. You know that the elevators in those buildings are really fast. And you know that they accelerate really quickly at the beginning, right? They speed up to a really high speed really, really quickly. When you're standing on that elevator floor and it starts accelerating upward, you feel like you're being pushed down against that floor, right? You feel really heavy. Are you any heavier than you, than you, than you are right now? No, your weight hasn't changed, right? But your perceived weight or your apparent weight has because the normal force of the elevator floor pushing up on you is higher than it is when you're just standing on the ground. So what we feel as our weight is the normal force. What actually is our weight is the force of gravity. I'll give you another one. Anybody ever gone skydiving? Bungee jumping? Bungee jumping? You've done bungee jumping? Well, it was like on a trampoline. <laughs> okay. Uh, on a trampoline doesn't count. <laughs> Real bungee jumping. I mean, like from something high, not from three feet off the ground back to three feet off the ground. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about too, but yeah, I, that's not what I mean. Though. Okay, if you've ever gone skydiving or bungee jumping, or if you've if you've ever ridden a, a free fall ride at an amusement park, um, uh, on our field trip, there's there's a free fall ride called the Space Shot. Uh, it lifts you up about 40 meters, and then it plunges you. It, you free fall for about 30 meters. It's about 29, 30 meters that you free fall. You actually feel weightless. You actually feel like you weigh nothing. If you were to hold something heavy out in front of you and then drop it as you started falling downwards, you would see it floating in front of your eyes the whole way down. From your frame of reference, from your perspective, it would not accelerate. It would, it would fall at the same rate as you, so it would literally hover in front of your eyes as you accelerate it downward. You feel weightless, but you're not weightless, right? You really do weigh something. You really weigh the same thing as you do now. You feel weightless because when you're free falling, there is no normal force. The floor or the seat or the whatever isn't pushing up on you, okay? Normal force is your apparent or perceived weight whereas force of gravity is your real weight or your actual weight. Got another one, friction. Friction is a force that resists motion. We'll say it's a force between two, uh, between two surfaces that resists motion. And there's two kinds of friction. One's called static. You guys know what that means, right? Not moving. Static friction. This is the force that keeps an object from beginning to move. You're rearranging your bedroom. The dresser's over on this wall, and you want to move it over to this wall. And you're too lazy to take out the drawers of your dresser and take out the clothes of your dresser and lift the dresser across with somebody's help, so you just start pushing the dresser over to one side with everything in it. When you do that, you find that it's really hard to get that dresser moving. Like it's really hard to budge it. That's a result of static friction. The static friction acts to keep an object from beginning to move, and the force of static friction is usually pretty high. Versus kinetic friction, the second kind of friction, which acts on an object that's already moving. So in other words, you push on that dresser, static friction is high. It's hard to get it moving. But you do get it moving. Once it's moving, it isn't static friction acting anymore. It's kinetic friction. 
the first force of friction that acts against an already moving object. Friction resists motion, but listen carefully. Resisting motion can actually cause motion. That's odd. The resisting of motion can cause motion. An example? I walk across this floor. Hey, what is it that allows me to walk across this floor? All kinds of things. One of the things is friction between my shoes and the floor. If there is no friction that resists the motion between my shoes and the floor, look at my shoe. Okay? My shoe is not moving relative to the floor. If there's no friction that resists that motion, then I don't get to walk forward. So it's the resistance of motion that caused motion, right? Same thing with a car, right? Same thing with a car. When you're on ice in a car and you spin your wheels, it's the fact that the wheels in the ice um, aren't resisting motion enough that causes you to not move forward with your car. Okay, if there's a force of friction that's big enough between the wheels and the, and the ice, then what happens to you? You move forward. That's why we use winter tires. It allows for more friction between your tires and the ice than do regular all-season tires. Was there a hand up back here? No, no, that's a good question, but no, that wouldn't be it at all. One more term here, not really a force, but it's something that we're going to use to put forces together. We'll go back to friction in just a moment here, but first I want to talk about this term called free body diagram. Sometimes they call it an FBD. A free body diagram is a diagram that shows all forces acting on an object. That becomes important for us later on as we start putting more and more of these forces together. Today we're going to focus on just friction. But as we start putting friction along with normal force, along with force of gravity, along with other forces, it becomes a, little bit more, becomes a lot more important to understand what this free body diagram is and to use these free body diagrams to help us solve problems. So a free body diagram is simply a diagram that shows all of the forces that act on an object. Let's go back to friction for a second, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. We said a few minutes ago that the two kinds of friction are static and kinetic friction. Static friction is that force of friction that prevents an object from beginning to move. That's when we're pushing on that dresser, push it across the room. It's the force that is difficult to overcome to get the dresser moving. Kinetic friction is the force of friction acting on the object that's already moving. Now that force of static friction is kind of a weird force. It's a pain in the butt force is what it is. The force of static friction is as big as I push with. You push on your dresser with 10 newtons, it pushes back with 10 newtons. You push on your dresser with 100 newtons, it pushes back with 100 newtons. It's a pain in the butt force because the harder you push, the harder it pushes back until we overcome it. There's a maximum possible force of static friction. And when I overcome that force of static friction, it kind of gives up, says, look, I can't do it anymore. I give up. But until you overcome that maximum force, until you apply a force that's bigger than that maximum force, it keeps pushing. You push, it pushes back. I push a 20, it pushes back with 20. I push a 50, it pushes back with 50. Until I push harder than the maximum possible force. Then it begins to move. And then I got kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is much less of a pain in the butt. Because kinetic friction is always the same value. If I'm pushing an object that's moving, and, static, and kinetic friction is acting on it, it doesn't matter how hard I push, kinetic friction is going to be the same value. It doesn't push back depending upon how hard I push. It's got a certain value, stays that value, okay, it's predictable. 
the force of kinetic friction, listen carefully to what I'm about to say, just drop the pens for a second. The force of kinetic friction is usually lower, not than the force of kinetic, but than the maximum force of kinetic. What do I mean by that? Oh, sorry, the maximum force of static. What do I mean by that? I got a desk up here. Let's say the maximum force of static friction is 20 newtons on this desk. Here's the pain in the butt nature of this, of this uh, situation with static friction here, okay? Maximum force of static friction is 20 newtons on the desk. I push on it with 5. What happens? Static friction pushes back with 5. Forces are balanced, doesn't move. I push on it with 10. Static friction pushes back with 10, doesn't move. Forces are balanced. I push on it with 19. What happens? Static friction pushes back with 19, doesn't move. It's a pain in the butt force. It pushes back as hard as I push back until I exceed the maximum value. Remember, the max is 20. I push with 5, it pushes with 5. I push with 10, pushes back with 10. I push with 19, it pushes back with 19. I push with 21, what happens? I just overcame the maximum force of static friction, and I've won. I beat it. Static friction lost because it couldn't exceed 20 newtons. Now what happens when it starts moving? It's kinetic friction. But what's the value of kinetic friction there? Maybe 16, maybe 15, maybe 18. It's bigger than the 5 newtons I was initially pushing with, but it's smaller than the maximum force of static friction. So I had to push with 20 newtons to overcome static friction, but then I only had to push with 16 newtons to keep it going. That's why when you push that dresser across your room, it's really difficult to get it moving. But once you get it moving, and you know this, right? You know this. Once you get it moving, you want to keep it moving because you know that it's easier to keep it moving than it is to get it moving. Right? You guys have all experienced that, right? It's, it's easier to get something moving. Sorry, harder to get something moving than it is to keep it moving. Because the max force of static friction that you have to overcome is bigger than the force of kinetic friction that you've got to apply to keep it moving. Okay, let's quantify these, okay? There are two equations, both of which appear on your data sheet that we're going to list right now, and then we're going to call it a day. The force of kinetic friction, the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction, not the value, not the direction. There is a direction associated with it, but the equation won't tell me that direction. It only tells me the magnitude, the absolute value. It's equal to, that's a Greek letter mu. It looks like an M. It kind of looks like a U. It's a Greek letter mu times the normal force. What is this? What is this mu thing? It's called the coefficient of kinetic friction. Should have a little subscript K beside it. Kind of a measure of how much two things stick together. The coefficient of kinetic friction between tire and ice is small because they don't stick together very well. The coefficient of kinetic friction between a tire and pavement is much higher because they stick together much better. The higher the coefficient, the bigger the force of friction you'll get. Fn, of course, is the normal force. I'll show you tomorrow how to calculate the normal force. Normal force is measured in newtons. There are no units for the coefficient of friction. The other equation, FSF max, this equation won't give us the force of static friction. Remember, I push with 5, it pushes back with 5. I push with 10, it pushes back with 10. It doesn't tell me what friction is. It just tell me, tells me what the maximum value of static friction is. It's equal to mu s times the normal force. Of course, mu s is the coefficient of static friction. How much two things stick together when they're not moving. Now, mu s will be greater than mu k. That means it's harder to get something moving to overcome this force than it is to keep something moving to overcome that force.